Will you stand, please? Father, we want to thank you so much for your word. We want to thank you that as we come to it, that it has the power to transform, it has the power to feed, it has the power to change us. And we want to thank you that it's your ability alone, by your spirit, to write your word upon our hearts. And we pray that whatever you're saying to any of us individually, but Lord, corporately, as a church, here at Court Farm, Father, please, will you bring your word to us. We submit ourselves to you and we call upon you for the help of your spirit and that covering that we need and your protection from any lie of the enemy and any distraction. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing and we're going to read the scriptures again. <coughs> Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff may comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please sit down. Well, friends, we're going to look at some of this psalm this morning, and we're going to look at it um, under the heading of the names of God in Psalm 23. The names of God in Psalm 23. Now, of course, the Lord reveals himself in the scriptures, doesn't he, as Jehovah, the self existing one, the one who, who is the great I am, the one who has been, the one who is and always will be. Nobody created him. He is Jehovah. But his character and his nature are so, uh, so fathomless, so vast, that what God does is he revealed himself to various individuals in the scriptures in particular ways that you and I might have an understanding of various aspects of who God is. And the marvellous thing is that in this psalm, we, uh, we, we, we not only read the very first phrase, the Lord is my shepherd. Now the word is isn't there in the original. It, it, it means the Lord my shepherd, Jehovah Rohi. But not only in that little phrase there, but in every other phrase in the psalm, you get hidden the names of Jehovah, the names of God. <clears throat> and so we're going to just look at a few of these. In a way, every one of them is a sermon and a half in itself. Don't worry, you will get your lunch. But on the other hand, uh, it does mean that we can't cover it all cover certain things in depth. So just take whatever the Lord brings to you and you can leave the rest, but whatever the Lord wants to bring to your own heart today as we just touch on something of these names of Jehovah, then take that to heart. It's what the Lord is saying to you that is the important thing rather than what I'm saying. <clears throat> so the Lord, as I've said, revealed himself to many in the scriptures at a particular time, in a particular manner, and they very often gave to God a particular name, Jehovah, whatever it is, <coughs> Jehovah Rohi, the Lord my shepherd. So for example, um, <coughs> a more up-to-date example, um, I was cycling um, with my daughter when we were on a church camp on one occasion, and we got completely lost. And I had my phone with me, there was no signal. So I couldn't access anything there. Uh, we asked somebody for directions, asked two people for directions. They hadn't a clue. 
So we were in a completely strange place and we just prayed, both of us, Lord, please, will you help us to get back to the camp? Well, I, you know, I'm not one of those who says the Lord said this, the Lord said this, and that every spare, spare minute. But I have to say, on this particular occasion, there was a witness in my heart, just occasionally, turn left, turn right. It wasn't a voice, it was just a quiet conviction. We got back to camp in good time. So I gave the name, I gave a name to the Lord, because I, I, I experienced the Lord in my, as my navigator on that particular name. So I called him Jehovah Tom Tom. <laughs> the Lord my satnav. <laughs> the Lord my satnav. Well, more seriously, let's look at some of these names that are here. The Lord is my shepherd. We're going to take a little bit of time with this. Shepherd, the word for shepherd occurs um, about 80 times, at least the verb for it. To be a shepherd occurs about 80 times in the Old Testament, <clears throat> and it's translated as shepherd uh, about 62 times. So it's there writ large. Not always, of course, applying to the Lord. But nevertheless, sometimes it certainly does. So, for example, Psalm 80, we're going to be looking at quite a few scriptures. If you can't keep up, you can always get the, the tape or the CD or whatever and listen to it again at your leisure. But Psalm 80 is another um, good example where um, <clears throat> if Psalm 23 is personal, David saying, the Lord is my shepherd, here... The shepherd, God is now the shepherd of his people as a whole. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you that lead Joseph like a flock. And you can pick up from that little phrase that he is the one who leads his people like a flock. That comes in Psalm 23, of course, as well. Indeed, all the phrases I would say in Psalm 23 spring out of this opening, step, this opening phrase that the Lord is my shepherd. Um, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 11. <clears throat> and in case you're worried, we're not going to look at all 80 scriptures here. <clears throat> Just a few. So Isaiah 40 and verse 11. He shall feed his flock and like a shepherd. And that is the, uh, the, the, that is the meaning of the verb <clears throat> from which we get the noun shepherd. So whenever you feed of of Whenever you read the word feed, it's, it's the shepherding role. The shepherd's role is to feed his flock. So verse 11, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. But it's not just feeding you, it's also other things. He shall gather the lambs in his, with his arm. Aren't you glad, if you are a young Christian particularly, that the Lord is carrying you? Such is his tender care. This is really what the Lord, being our shepherd, is all about. It's his tender care for the flock as a whole and for you as an individual believer in the Lord Jesus as one of his sheep. <coughs> he will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom, close to his heart. Isn't that wonderful? That's where the Lord is carrying you. But there comes a time when God is wanting to bring you to maturity. And part of the mark of maturity is that actually you are able to look after other believers and carry them. So it goes on to say that he gently leads those that are with young. And the Lord knows exactly the right pace at which to take us. He does not drive us. And I think on one occasion, if I remember rightly, in Genesis, uh, when Esau and Jacob managed to reconcile. How wonderful is that? And Esau says, uh, I'll be with you, I'll go ahead, and so on and so forth. And Jacob says, no, look, just let me go at my own pace. I've got women here, I've got children, and we've got the flocks, and we need to go at a gentle pace. And that, the way that he speaks is a reflection of an understanding of that that is how the Lord treats us as well. So, <clears throat> the Lord is our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. 
Uh, it's usually translated by this verb to feed. So, for example, Genesis chapter 29 <clears throat> and verse 9. I'm giving you these because you may not realise that when you actually read the word to feed, that it's actually the shepherding role. And here is a good example, Genesis chapter 29 and verse 9. <clears throat> While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Or the authorised version says, for she kept them, for she, <coughs> for she looked after them. And uh, I'm, I said to you this is translated as, as feed. I'm sorry, this one is keep. So you sometimes find that the role of the shepherd is, is, is put in our, in our la la language in terms of, of keeping, that is protecting and guiding. If feeding is to provide, keeping is to protect. And then Psalm, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 48. This was the scripture I meant to uh, refer you to. Genesis chapter 48 and verse 15. <clears throat> so it's the same book. So you haven't got too far to look. And if you're not sure where Genesis is, there's no guilt in that unless you've been a Christian for a long time but it's the first book of the Bible so Genesis 48 and verse 15 he blessed Joseph <clears throat> this is Jacob called Israel he blessed Joseph and said the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked the God who has been my shepherd or the God who has fed me all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me. So here God feeds us. I hope you see that there. And then uh, same, uh, the, next, the next chapter, <coughs> Genesis 49 and verse 24. <coughs> There's another statement here about the Lord being our shepherd. <coughs> his bow remained firm. His, uh, his arms were agile. This is speaking about Joseph. From the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. And then you get this little phrase in brackets. From there is the shepherd with a capital S. It's the Lord. The shepherd was going to come forth from Joseph. The stone of Israel. Now that's a little extra that's put. Draw your attention to it simply because um, if the Lord is our shepherd, it is from that basis that he is then able to be our rock. He is the one, the word means to be able to build something. So if you as a church are going to be built, you need to know the Lord as your shepherd. And I suppose the burden on my heart as I'm looking at all these names, we could look at all of these names in a kind of doctrinal way. And there's every value in doing that. But essentially what I want to bring to you is the encouragement from the Lord that you should make him these things, that you should know him in these ways in your experience. My friends, is the Lord your shepherd? It's one thing to kind of read about this, but actually it's another thing to know it in your experience. And David, in that psalm, basically what he's saying is, through all his experiences in life, he had come to the place where he knew that it was the Lord who was feeding him. It was the Lord who was, who was sustaining him. It was the Lord who was providing for him. It was the Lord who was keeping him. No matter what circumstances, and we read about some of them, don't we, in Psalm 23. No matter what the circumstances are, it, it was the Lord who was his shepherd. So my friend, the Lord is wanting to feed you. He is not expecting you to live your Christian life by any effort of the flesh and being kind of working something up. He wants to feed you. And he feeds you primarily through the scripture. Through the scriptures. They are your bread. They are your food. And when it goes on in Psalm 23 to say he makes me to lie down in green pastures, that at least in part is what that is talking about. <clears throat> so 
Are you, has he brought you, I'm jumping the gun a little bit, has he brought you to a place where you are lying down in the pasture of the word, feeding from the word as any good sheep feeds on grass? And being fed for, provided for by the shepherd. This is your pasture. Friend, God wants to, uh, to teach you to, to, to feed for yourself so that God himself can speak to you through the, through the scripture. More of that in a minute. But God can protect you. You have such a relationship. Look, a shepherd knows the sheep intimately, doesn't he? I mean, I'm speaking to you as if, of course, you all know about Middle Eastern sheep, uh, shepherds and sheep. You know about these things. Sure you do, yeah? Hopefully you do. <laughs> but the shepherd knows every one of his sheep by name doesn't he? John 10, the Lord Jesus, I know every one of my sheep by name. He knows you. And he knows just your weaknesses and your tendencies to go off at a tangent and whatever. He knows about you and he, and he knows you by name and he is able to bring you to a place where he can feed you. Well, <clears throat> the role of a shepherd <clears throat> in the scripture, the role of a shepherd is also to rule, and it, the leaders of the people were called shepherds. Uh, so, for example, King Cyrus of Persia is called in Isaiah as God's shepherd, because God was going to use him to restore the children of Israel back to their land. Um, and sometimes um, you, you find the whole matter of, of ruling uh, when it's actually there in the scripture, it's actually talking about feeding and being a shepherd. So, for example, there's no need to, to, to turn to this, but you probably remember these words from um, a Christmas carol service or round about that time. Um, Micah chapter 5. You, Bethlehem, Ephrata, are, um, are not least among the children of... How does it go? <laughs> you Bethlehem Ephrata, too little among the clans of Judah, from, from you will go forth for me one who is to be the ruler of Israel. It's the same word. The shepherd of Israel, the ruler. The Lord is our ruler, but he's not just our ruler and our captain, he's your shepherd as well. Uh, <clears throat> let's, um, now I think there's one more thing I want to draw your attention to as well. Interestingly, sometimes this, this same sort of concept of feeding or nurturing or providing for is also translated in the book of Proverbs um, uh, by the word companion or friend. And that is part of the meaning of this, of this Hebrew word, to be a shepherd, to, 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 to feed. It means to be a companion. Now, um, I'll give you the scriptures. You can look at them for yourself. Don't turn to them for the sake of time, but you can just jot them down uh, and look at them a little bit later on. But um, Because all of them actually are not good. They're speaking about people to avoid their company, people to avoid being their friends. But let's turn the thing on its head. The Lord wants to be your friend. He's called you, not servants only, but friends. Now, of course, these things have to be worked out. You have to come into that friendship. Don't think that just because you're a, a recent convert, you can say, oh, God's my friend. Well, you, you certainly, you're acquainted with him and you've got to know him. That's great. But to be a friend of somebody means that you spend time with them and you get to know them. Here are the verses in Proverbs. Proverbs 28 and verse 7. Proverbs 13 and verse 20. Proverbs 29 and verse 3. And Proverbs 22 and verse 24. And I'll just read you the last one. <clears throat> 22 and 24. Do not associate with a man given to anger. Do you get the idea? Be careful who you associate with. So friends, if you're going to be one who knows the Lord as your shepherd, the flip sign of that is be careful who you associate with. Because if you want to know the Lord as your shepherd, you don't want others to shepherd you or feed you in a wrong kind of way. 
Do not associate with a man given to anger or go with a hot-tempered man. Or you will learn his ways, the scripture says, and find a snare for yourself. And I would want to keep you from being ensnared. So make the Lord your shepherd. Make him your number one friend. And make sure that you keep company with the right kind of people. Um, now, just to balance this out, let's remind ourselves of the New Testament. Jesus is spoken of in John chapter 10 as the good shepherd. And he's spoken of there in terms of to do with redemption. He is the shepherd who laid his life down for the flock. There are five occasions in John chapter 10 where Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. So the implications for you, my friend, and for you as a church, is that if the Lord is going to be your shepherd, you need to make sure that you learn to discern what he is saying, that you hear his voice. And that, of course, <clears throat> takes time. But the Lord is a very patient teacher, in my experience. And then in Hebrews 13 and verse 20, John chapter 10, he's called the good shepherd. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20, he is called the great shepherd of the sheep. And aren't you glad that he is? And there, it's to do with resurrection. The God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, we read he's described as the chief shepherd. Now why is he called the chief shepherd? Simply because God in his wisdom has put shepherds, under shepherds, shepherds with a small s, to care for the flock. And of course they need to reflect something of the heart and the ways, knowing the ways of the great shepherd, <coughs> of the sheep, the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus himself. But he is the great, he is the chief shepherd and here it's to do with the giving of rewards. And so to those who do have to shepherd the flock under the leadership of the great shepherd, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And the role of a pastoral ministry or eldership, an elder is not necessarily the same as a pastor. But to be in eldership means that you certainly have to engage in ministry that is very much to do with pastoring, which is to feed the flock, to tend the flock, to rule the flock when necessary. And if that causes you a problem, can I just say to you that in Hebrews 13, there's the one reference that we find where um, the writer to the Hebrews says, obey those that have the rule over you. That word for obey is not a matter of slavish obedience. It means to be persuaded. And you say, well, why doesn't it say that? I don't know. Ask the, ask the translators of the King James Version. <laughs> But sometimes, being, being serious, it is difficult to convey every aspect of the words in their original language. But essentially, this is what it means, to be persuaded. So, so therefore, the role of an elder or a pastor is to persuade. He's not there to dominate. And if an elder comes to you and seeks to persuade you that you're doing something wrong or going in a wrong direction, I would be very, very careful before not going along with it. Go to the Lord and say, Lord, you're my shepherd, but here is my good brother and he's got real concerns. Now, please, if I've got this wrong, will you show me? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I trust you do. <clears throat> so, the Lord is my shepherd. That is the place where the Lord wants you to come to individually and to come to as a church. Back to Psalm 23. I shall not want. I lack nothing. <coughs> well, <coughs> what is the name of the Lord that is being talked about here? I want to suggest to you it is, uh, it is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. So will you please turn to the book of Genesis again. The book of Genesis again. Apologies, I've got 
various cards here and I just need to make sure I get the right one. There we are. Genesis chapter 22. I hope you remember the story. The Lord tells Abraham to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. <clears throat> and then at the 11th hour, the angel speaks to Abraham, calls out to him and says, Abraham, calls out and says, Lord, here am I. And he says, I don't want you to put your son to death. I don't want you to offer him as a sacrifice. And then uh, the Lord opens Abraham's eyes and he sees a ram caught in a thicket and he offers that ram instead. These things are, are, are shot through, full of important truth for us. But what I want to draw out to you is really enshrined in the letter to the Romans, where the Lord says, He who gave his only begotten, his only son, he who did not spare his only son, Romans 8, verse 32, he who did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also with him freely give us all things? My friends, the Lord has provided you and I with a lamb. He's provided you and I with a sacrifice through which we can find that our sins are forgiven and we can come to know the Lord, etc., as we've been worshipping the Lord this morning. But friends, if the Lord gave his son freely and did not withhold his most treasured possession, do you not think also that in him, with him, the Lord will not freely give you everything? Of course he will. So really what this, this is saying is, um, who are you looking to for your provision? I'm not talking about so much materially, although I'm certainly including that, because the scripture says if we seek his kingdom first and his righteousness, all these things can be added to us. But who are you looking for as the answer to your problems? Who are you looking for as the one to solve your dispeace? Who are you looking for as the one who um, to sort out your lack of direction or your uncertainties? Whatever these things are, David's saying, whatever I need, I shall not want. I lack nothing because I know that with the Son of God has come everything. Friends, whatever your need is, is in the Lord. Where are you looking to for your provision is really what I'm challenging you about. If you're looking for your provision for um, elsewhere, if you're looking for your provision in another, yes, the place of a church, the house of God, should be a place of pasture. It should be a place of feeding. But that is not your, to be your primary source of sustenance. It's not to be your primary source of food. So why do you come to church? Do you come to church to have a bit of a pep up, to have a, you know, because I feel so wonderful and the joy, and I do like the music. You know, friends, these are, these are not the important things. I mean, great to have the music, great to have the sense of fellowship, but, but friends, what happens when you go out? You know, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, the Lord Jesus. Isn't that what the scripture says? It does. <laughs> First letter of John, chapter 1, right hand page, about three quarters of the way down in my Bible. <clears throat> I shall not want. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Well, I trust you do. May the Lord bring you to such a place. Here is a man who the Lord provided for. He was a king of Israel, living in a time of judgment. Really difficult time for him to live. And he heard a word from the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, go out to the Babylonians. That is where you're going to find your life. That's where you're going to find safety. That's where you're going to find your provision. And it's a really hard message to leave everything behind. But the Lord was clear, that is where you need to go. And he, as the king, 
chose to believe that word. There was another king who didn't, but his name was Jehoiachin. And he spent the rest of his life in prison. Most of it, anyway. But at the end of his life, the king of Babylon took him out of prison, gave him new clothes, and he fed at the king's table till his dying day. I mean, what provision? Now, all right, you may not, it may be not the future you'd have chosen for yourself if you were in his shoes. But friends, all I'm saying is that is God's provision. For Jeremiah himself, the place of God's provision was in a courtyard outside a prison. And when the whole city was starving, Zedekiah made sure that Jeremiah was provided for. You and I are going to live in increasingly difficult days. And maybe for some of us, maybe, we sometimes won't know where our next meal is coming from. My friends, the Lord can provide. The Lord will provide. Even if he has to send a raven to do it. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, read about Elijah. The Lord is my shepherd. <clears throat> I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. We probably will do this. If you're wondering how far we're going with this, well, we're going to do verse 2 and I think probably touch on verse 3. <clears throat> he makes me to lie down in green pasture. Well, what, what name is this? <clears throat> Well, I'm going to ask you to turn to Exodus chapter 17, please. Exodus chapter 17 and verse 1. This is a name which may come as a bit of a surprise to you in this context, but I think it's true. Exodus chapter 17 and verse 1. The children of Israel <coughs> come to a place called Rephidim, and that name means resting places. <coughs> and there was no water for the people to drink. And there follows mum uh, grumbling, mumbling, complaining, etc., quarrelling. And the Lord has much to teach through that incident. But then in verse 8, Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. Amalek, their strategy was to pick off the weak, the stragglers at the back. Amalek was an, a descendant of Esau. Amalek and Esau speak about the old nature, which is the flesh. So here are the people of God... <coughs> at rest in Rephidim, but there are stragglers, there are people who are not as wholehearted as they should be, and the old nature is going to pick them off. That is the picture here. Now, what happens is that Aaron, Moses and her go up the mountain, and Moses has to hold up his hands. This is a picture of prayer. Corporate prayer, I would suggest to you, because there were the three of them that were doing it. And while the three of them were up the mountain, Joshua was down in the valley below, and he was the one who was dealing with Amalek on the ground. If you and I are going to deal with our old nature, you cannot deal with it just in the valley. By which I mean, if you've got a problem with anger, say, you can fight it as much as you like, you won't get the victory by sheer force of willpower. Neither will you deal with it by uh, strength of or hours spent at the counselling room or the therapy room. That won't solve your problem. You need to be up on the mountain. You need to seek the Lord. You need to be in his presence. And sometimes these things are involved. You need to be praying with other people about them. <clears throat> but that's where you need to be. And the scripture is so practical, I think, because it says in Galatians 5 regarding the flesh, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. He's really saying, be on the mountain, spend time with the Lord, develop that, <coughs> develop that friendship with the Lord, learn to make him your shepherd, follow him, walk with him, walk in the spirit, and the flesh will look after itself, more or less. 
But that's the way of it, friends. It's marvellous. But if you think that you're going to deal with your anger, etc., by just remaining on the mountaintop and not being willing to face it and put it to death, you've got another thing coming. <coughs> I once knew, some, who knew somebody who, whose um, philosophy was that no Christian should ever work for anybody who's not a Christian. Why? Because, well, you've got to keep yourself pure and safe and you don't want to be outside of temptation, etc. I mean, how ridiculous. It's, it's, it's learning to walk with the Lord in the very place where there is challenge and temptation sometimes. But then you have to say, no, I'm not going to give in to that anger. I'm not going to give in to this. Well, what is? Uh, please, I'm picking that out as a, just in the first example that comes into my head. I mean nothing special by it. Please don't think I'm getting at you. <laughs> well, there we are. So, the mountaintop and the valley. This is how the Lord dealt with Amalek. Now, why am I mentioning this? Go to the end of the chapter, please. Verse 13, Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it, here it is, the Lord my banner, Jehovah Nissi. What I'm saying is, friends, if we're going to lie down in green pastures, there are battles to be fought. Make the Lord your banner. Learn to fight the battles in his way. And I've just given you one particular battle in the area of dealing with our old nature. But I think there are other battles that sometimes we face. Of course there are. But we need to learn to let the Lord <coughs> be our banner. <coughs> Jehovah Nissi. Uh, Job chapter 11 and verse 19. <clears throat> Job chapter 11 and verse 19. God willing, we're going to consider something of this this afternoon, actually. It's a little foretaste, but one of the promises that the Lord brings here is you would lie down and none would disturb you. So friends, if anything is disturbing you, look to the Lord to be your banner. And learn to fight that disturbance in the way that he wants you to. The next phrase of Psalm 23. He makes me to lie down in green pasture. He <clears throat> leads me beside the still waters. <clears throat> Literally... Waters of rest. That's what it means. <laughs> Waters of rest. Rest in the scripture speaks of a number of things. It speaks about our inheritance. If you like, the purposes of God for our lives that he's bringing us into. You find that in Psalm 95 and verse 11. I swore in my anger, says the Lord, that they shall not enter my rest. They shall not enter my inheritance. It's speaking about the promised land there. <clears throat> but rest is also uh, speaking, uh, spoken of in terms of marriage, actually, the marriage relationship. This is physically where we find our home, <clears throat> our rest. You find that in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 9 and in Ruth chapter 3 and verse 1. I'm going to apply it not so much to marriage, but what about your relationship to the Lord? You know, there is a rest relationship in our love with the Lord. And rest is also spoken of in the sense of the place of God's rule. Psalm 132 and verse 14 This is my resting place, says the Lord, speaking about Zion. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell. Isn't that an encouragement? Here is the place where the Lord wants to put his feet. The Lord wants to find a rest here in your church. That is what this Psalm 23 is speaking about. And he is able to lead you into that. And the word for lead there, 
uh, has, the, <coughs> has indeed the meaning of, of protecting and sustaining. <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, Gen Genesis 33 and verse 14, I've already referred to this. This is Jacob's words to Esau. Let my Lord, I pray you, pass over before his servant and I will lead on gently. According as the cattle that goes before me and the children be able to endure until I come to my Lord in Mount Zia, etc. Well, we must move on, but I leave that with you. The Lord uh, wants to lead us until we come into his rest. Those purposes for him, that future for him, but also into a closer love relationship with him as well. Actually, rest has got a third meaning to it as well, which is really there is a rest to the people of God in the sense that we enter into a place with God where we know that it's the Lord who's doing the work. I haven't got time to explain that in detail or to enlarge upon that. But again, the Lord wants to bring you into a place where he is doing the work in you and through you and in you corporately. There indeed are still waters. And then we'll finish with this. Well, I may touch on one more thing, but let's look at the next thing. Verse 3. Oh, the name of the Lord. You were wondering about that, weren't you? Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is my peace. The Lord is my completeness. The Lord is my well-being, my wholeness, if you like. Well, <clears throat> verse, verse 3. In case I forget to give it to you, let me give it to you now. He restores my soul, Jehovah Rophi, the Lord my healer. Now, the scriptures elsewhere speak about physical healing. Of course they do. And in fact, if you look at that particular statement, Jehovah Rophi, you'll find that in Exodus 15 and verse 26. The Lord is saying there, I will not put any of the plagues that I put on Egypt upon you. <clears throat> So that's the context of that little phrase. But in Psalm 23, he doesn't say, he makes me healthy. This is not a health, wealth and prosperity gospel. This is, he restores my soul. And your soul in the Bible speaks of your, your will and your emotions and your mind. And therefore, friend, what I'm saying is, we all of us need to know how the Lord wants to restore and how he can restore our soul. And for those particular in leadership, um, and I include there those of you who are um, husbands, fathers, heads of your families, if there is a need for restoration within the family, you need to know how to minister that restoration in the context of your family. <clears throat> Healing from what? Restoring from what? Let me give you some examples. Psalm 51 and verse 17. Psalm 51 and verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. The brokenness here is because of the seriousness of sin. Friends, sin can break. Sin can damage. And we sometimes need not only to be forgiven, but to be restored. The damage needs to be broken. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the scriptures here speak about a broken heart. Broken, really the word means shattered. And when the Lord Jesus came, uh, you find his ministry recorded for you in Luke chapter 4, at least he's quoting from Isaiah uh, chapter 61, but when the, when the Lord Jesus um, in the temple, at the outset of his ministry, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and to heal the broken hearted. 
And then he also goes on to say to set at liberty those who are bruised. And that phrase literally means to set at liberty those whose lives are shattered. Friends, you don't need me to tell you that we are living in days when there is an increasing shattering of people's lives. When there are increasing number of emotional hurts, emotional afflictions, mental afflictions that are caused by all sorts of things. <clears throat> One of which is sin. <coughs> Usually is somewhere along the line. Friends, and we need to come to the Lord as the one who restores our soul. Now what I'm saying to you, my dear friends, is that if you need your soul restoring, the Lord is able to do it. Don't look to another to do it, primarily. If the Lord shows you to pray with another or whatever, that's fine. But it's the Lord who restores your soul. Psalm 34 and verse 8. I said I'd give you a few scriptures about this. I beg your pardon, verse 18. Psalm 34 and verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And Psalm 147 and verse 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. I'm no medical person, and I know there is at least one person here who is, so I've got to be very careful. But, you know, there is a, there is a, there is a healing process, and sometimes the wound has to be exposed to the air, but it sometimes needs to be protected, sometimes covered up. The Lord knows just how to do that. And, you know, the marvellous thing is that actually that there is a balm in Gilead. There is an oil. This is part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to restore and to bind up where there are wounds. If that is you, my friend, please do seek for help. The key to restoration I will give you is this. Forgiveness. If somebody's damaged you, you need to forgive. And I'm not talking about an emotional kind of equilibrium where this thing doesn't affect you anymore. Forgiveness basically means to release. It's an act of the will. And friends, that's what you need to do. The emotions will take time to work through or can do. But essentially, you need to say, Lord, I leave that person with you. Because God does not want you to judge that person. He is the judge. Let, let the Lord deal with that person. Don't you go about dealing with it. And don't hold a grudge against him or her because of whatever it is. If you don't do that, if you don't let go, you will not be able to receive the Lord's restoration. And watch it, because the Lord says, if you don't forgive others, he won't forgive you. The Lord has this wonderful ability to be able to erase from his memory everything that you and I have done that is wrong. But he also has an ability to recall it, should he need to. I just give you that for your consideration and for your warning. <clears throat> and so, my friends... When there is forgiveness, then the Lord can minister to you. And this is part of the ministry, I would suggest to you, of the laying on of hands. We don't actually, I don't think, read of any occasion in the New Testament where the Lord Jesus heals the brokenhearted, but he ministers to all sorts of people in all sorts of different ways. And sometimes, very often indeed, it is with the laying on of hands. And that is the reason why that ministry, that particular um, process, don't like to use the word ritual, but you know what I mean, is, is there in the church. Hebrews 6 speaks about it. The teaching about the laying on of hands. And so the Lord is able to free the shattered. The Lord is able to deal with the mental afflictions. The Lord is able to heal those that, who are oppressed by the devil. Acts 10 and verse 38. He restores my soul. <clears throat> and we'll finish with this. I was going to, well, let's just touch on it. The end of verse 3. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake, Jehovah Tzikainu. 
The Lord, my righteousness, the Lord is able to lead you. Hallelujah for that. And he wants to lead you, but will you notice it's in paths of righteousness. And friends, this is what the Lord wants for your, for, for, for your testimony, both for you individually as a believer, but for you as a church. The Lord has led me in paths of righteousness. Jehovah Tzikhenu. Yeah, and this is what I feel I should finish with. Just touch on one little phrase on verse 4. There are times, there are, aren't there, when we go through difficulties that make them be very painful and difficult and dark. Verse 4, yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. But, friends, if the Lord is your shepherd, if the Lord is leading you, if you are learning to feed on him, if you are learning to receive all the provision from God, as verse 1 speaks about, if you are learning to lie down in green pastures, if you are learning to drink from those still waters, if you're learning to come into that rest in the Lord, whatever difficulties you go through, he is with you. He is with you. Jehovah, what is it? It's gone from me, and I haven't got it immediately in front of me, but I can tell you where to find it. It's the last verse in the prophecy of, e of Ezekiel. And uh, this is the... Okay, this is Jehovah Shammah, I beg your pardon, and the other one, the Lord my peace, is Jehovah Shalom. Duh. Sorry about that. Okay, so verse 35, this is the last verse. This is a description of, the, of Ezekiel's vision of Jerusalem. And this is... Speaking about the place where the Lord is living. This is where the Lord dwells. And it says, the name of the city from that day forth shall be Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. And my friends, this is my, te this is my prayer for you all. That this will be the testimony of this church. That the Lord will be there. And that you will be able to say, Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is with me. And whatever you go through individually, you can say, the Lord is with me. Praise his name. Amen. Let's pray, please. <clears throat> Father, we thank you so much that your nature and your character is so vast that in a way no one name can, can contain it or summarise it. And... No one person's experience has, has known it all in a sense. Lord, though we want to thank you that each one of us, because these things are written for us in your word, each one of us can know you as the Jehovah Rohi, whatever it is. And Lord, where any one of us needs to know you and experience you in any of these ways, Lord, would you enable us to come into that place where we do experience you, where we have that testimony that you are our Jehovah, my Jehovah, whatever. And Lord, would you do it for this church as well, I do pray. Lead us in paths of righteousness. Bring that restoration. Provide for us, we pray. We commit ourselves to you and we give you all the glory and all the praise. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for being our good shepherd. Blessed be your name. Help us to hear your voice. Amen. Amen.